Welcome to another edition of New Wine Uncorked. I'm Matt Farrell, that's Tony Wynn, and that's Phil Berlin, and we're stoked that you joined us. Uh, we are just laughing because this is about the second or third time that we've uh, tried this because we've had wonderful internet uh, experience already. And that's kind of like how life is today. We've been talking about power, we've been talking about meaning and truth, and this week we were talking about like purity of heart. Like as a Christian, if we're pursuing the one whose heart we want to step into, what does that do for the church? And there's been a lot that's gone on since our, our last discussion, and, and we were talking about the meaning of truth and how people are trying to come in and accommodate uh, uh, messages and, and, and warp them around whatever their purity of heart is, you know, pursuing the one. And sometimes their pursuit of, of the Christian God is different, and we've been seeing this play out. I was mentioning to um, this group that we've been talking about uh, at, at my church here uh, down in Folsom, about racial reconciliation, I was bringing to mind uh, the togetherness in Portland, what happened when there was the prayer group that we met with, the pastors for the 24-hour prayer group, and then how the Bethel group came in and tried to basically push them out. And these two people were, you know, groups were supposedly pursuing the same God. And then we have this weekend. Oh, wow. This weekend was a huge eruption on the world stage as to what power and what is the purity of heart of the Christian faith. And so I was just wondering what you guys thought in light of this weekend. If the, if the Church of Christ is pursuing the heart of Christ, how do they respond to a uh, leader in, in that basically proclaims, look, this virus, everything that the science and everything are telling you, it's not that big of a deal. In fact, I overcame it. That's his language. I overcame it. I am the power. And the, the the folks on his behind his spectrum were saying, like, look at he has overcome. He is a warrior. It, it was like they're building up this Nietzschean Superman, this Uberman. Look, Trump is our savior, just like Franklin Graham said. He's pushing back the forces of evil. How does the church then have a pure heart? What are we purely uh, um, uh, seeking after? Yeah. Well, I think, oh. oh, no, Phil, you totally take that, Phil. All right. So, yeah, just, just coming from the top, I think it does connect a little bit to, I think, our conversation last week when we were just talking about how um, we have a, a church that, that, that kind of pursues the winners. Um, and we kind of look to the winners, the overcomers. These are the, these are the things that we look to, is looking to a broken Savior and just wanting to uh, – Kind of live into that is is kind of where we're we're away from that um so we want to i mean talk today about um just the notion of what we sell ourselves to if we're selling ourselves to being broken or selling ourselves to being a winner then we'll definitely we'll be siding with uh what we see going on in our news right now so go ahead john no thank you i i the the similarities i think that we see um with the German theologians that we often engage with, with Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Karl Barth, and how they, in their theology and their corpus, rejected the the German church um, because of the marriage of the theological grammar of Christ with the nationalistic tendency, I think is something that's a cause for concern for us today. Um, I know that it's popular to, to call people Nazis today um, who who disagree with us uh, on either sides. Uh, there, there's always an accusation of the other side being Nazis. Um, but I think we lose meaning in, in just flimsy, in just attributing the word Nazi without any context. But there, there are stark and startling similarities, um, I think, between the German church um, during the Third Reich and, and the evangelical church today. Um, and so, Matt, with the language that you're talking about this weekend of um, the ministers of propaganda, of Ingram and, and uh, uh, Tucker and uh, Alex Jones and Metaxas, man, these guys, the, the liturgy that they push forward and how Trump is this overcomer, um, look 
at uh, how he has defeated COVID. Um, and, and Trump is now saying, don't be afraid of COVID. Do what I did and you will overcome COVID. Uh, yeah, I, I, in that, what I see, I, I can see how there can be a mirroring of the Christ figure of how Christ overcame sin on our behalf. But I think the the distinction would be Christ does not call us to join in sin to overcome sin. Rather, Christ overcame sin. Therefore, we are in Christ as we overcome sin. But for Trump, I, I know people accuse me of being socialistic and collectivist. But Trump, there is a collectivist um, motivation where we have to join Trump in order to overcome COVID. And there's a loss of the individual uh, because we have to partake in what Trump has done in order to overcome. So we cannot, COVID has not been overcome by Trump. The only way to overcome COVID is to, and I think that will start uh, difference in between the work of Christ, because Christ, Christ does not say, "Join me in the work of sin and the and the effects of sin is overcome and undone." No, I myself alone have overcome sin, and and this language uh, harkens back to the Third Reich and very much for Hitler. It was, um, "Join me and join my party, and we will make Germany great again." We will bring glory to Germany. Um, uh, we will bring uh, uh, the nation forward to its rightful ownership of blood and soil. And, and so I, I see the commonalities. This isn't to call evangelicals Nazis. This is to say evangelicals are evangelicals. And, and this, is, this is a tense moment we live in when the similarities of a national leader um, co-opting theological language for political gain is a trope that we've seen played out time and time again. Yeah, it's uh, isn't it in, in interesting too with uh, you talking about that with this weekend and that language commandeering the language uh, this you know overcoming the question will be is then what of the others within the White House and how they overcome this COVID because. If Trump was able to overcome it on his own, then theoretically, the White House, you know, chief of staff or the the secretary, you know, the the anyone in the White House who's contracted it should be able to overcome it just like him. It's not the cocktails, it's not the drugs that helped. Uh, uh, if he has overcome it, mind you, uh, the accounts that you read, you you can read where first five to seven days people feel better, and all of a sudden on the eighth day, you know, the 10th day, boom, they get smacked, you know, look at the timeline for Herbert Kane. you know, uh, uh, the, the Congress person, uh, Kane got it on like June 24th. And it was like by July 30th, he was dead. But for the first 10 days, he said, I'm feeling great. I'm feeling great. So again, and it's not that anyone's hoping for that. Absolutely. I want the eradication of COVID. I w want right now, pray, you know, we just had a, a couple of cases coming on our campus. And the, the way in which uh, our administration is dealing with it is trying to lock it up and put it to the side and everyone else, though, can function as if it's not here. It's not like we've gotten stricter with our masking policy. We haven't gotten stricter in my classrooms as far as like the social distancing. I'm asking questions. They're like, no, you just you tough it out, basically, like what Trump's tweets are is that this is not any worse than the common cold, the common flu. And then they'll point to the numbers, 98% people survival rate. Yeah, well, that's because we're only six months into this. Give it another year when we start to see the survival rate because as the numbers of cases continue to level out, but then the deaths continue to increase, what's going to happen? That percentage is going to come down just like we have in the, the COVID cases, I mean, in the flu. And so I think if we're focusing on that, though, it's even the wrong focus. It's who is going to overcome this? And especially with the church, is are they selling themselves like in, in – you know, to your point, Phil, what is it that we're giving ourselves into? Because the purity of heart of the church can only come when she is willing to lay down like Jesus did. And like what you were saying, Tony, he didn't come and then said, hey, now you continue to participate in your sin until that second, you know, second coming. And I'll, I'll understand because you're human. You know, sin is OK. It's a part of who you are. To be human is to sin, you know, and that's how kind of the church as long as it's just not as bad of sin. 
And so then what has happened is we've, we've looked and it's become part of this uh, movement. If, well, we're going to rid the, the, the country of sin. What are the two greatest sins? Abortion and gay marriage. You know, so now we can get the court's uh, understanding. So instead of uh, uh, loving people into transformation, the idea from what seems to be the religious right, right is to legislate behavior modification. You know, my concern is, is to your point, Tony, hey, if you're not with Trump, you're against him. What happens then when we start to get into and we're see, we've seen it play out with uh, our racial tensions? Uh, well, hey, you know what? You know, just chill. OK, the, the Black Lives Matter, we hear you and stuff, but you got to just settle down. You know, civility, please be respectful. The change is coming as long as you participate with us at our level. And now even Trump's gone into the econ economics and said, I'm going to stop the talks for the stimulus COVID because it's not that big of a deal. Right. Why do we need it? If he was able to get out and get in there and within five days, boom, it's gone because he's just tough. Well, that's how we are Americans. We're tough. You know, pull us up by the bootstrap. My concern is, is how that the implications between our uh, uh, racial tensions, between the gender equalities, between the, the, the uh, sexual uh, orientation and, and how we co t continue to relate with those kind of situations. If it's going to be the one way because this guy is the great overcomer, man, what happens to the faith of the church? Who do we follow? Yeah. Yeah, the big potential that we'll just <clears throat> we'll follow the um, the popular leader at the time, whether that baton gets passed to whether it be this one here or or the next one, as we kind of have for you know popular leaders beforehand. Um, but the message that connects to just just yeah, whether we give ourselves to ourselves or just give ourselves the notion of overcome and follow me. Um, overcome by following me or uh, I don't know I don't know how that plays out <laughs> but just the whole notion of yeah we follow you like wait the notion where we're, we're pointing ourselves to something else because we're following you in coming to fall down before our father and, and following his will and yielding to that and not saying no I got this you no know, we're going well nah man I'm not necessarily following you in that regard um ah oh, man there's a couple other things I want to say but I just lost them. This went right out my ear. So go ahead, Tony. Yeah. So lest somebody says, man, Tony never reads his Bible and all he does is, you know, uh, scrolls through Twitter to, uh, today or this week in my Bible reading uh, with uh, a Bible study group I've been going through the book of Samuel with. Um, we've been walking through uh, the narrative of Samuel leading into Saul and how before Saul takes over the kingship, there's this account of Samuel making a sacrifice on an altar, and God gives them the victory against, I think, the Amalekites or the Philistines. And then a couple of chapters later, while Saul is installed as king, um, he's waiting for Samuel, but Samuel's late to the battle to make the sacrifice. So Saul does the sacrifice, um, and then Samuel says, yep, yeah, because you did that, um, the kingship will be taken away from you. Like God would have blessed you, but you took it into your own hands. Um, and then Saul's like, but I did the same thing you did. And I think that's revealing of um, the, the typical pattern that we as, as humans fall into, where we think that if we use our religiosity to empower our political interests, we can some sort of uh, somehow come up with like this magical, um, uh, formula for control that we can become masters of our own destiny and and I see this type of archical like narrative play out even before us where for so long the evangelical moral majority Republican conservative uh, chant was we need a conservative uh, president so that we can appoint conservative justices to repeal uh, Roe v. Wade. And so with the passing of uh, Ginsburg, now we have Amy Barrett. Um, and so the irony is this, if, and this isn't a QAnon conspiracy, um, you, but you guys should definitely go check out the series we have on the QAnon conspiracies. This is me just trying to plot a timeline for us. So we have the nomination of uh, Barrett, and then we have the recent um, ceremony in the Rose Garden to um, 
confirm that nomination on behalf of President Trump or whatnot. Uh, and it's at that ceremony that epidemiologists and our scientists are saying, man, that was a super spreader event. It was in that moment that uh, you have um, uh, Conway getting sick. You have uh, Pastor Greg Laurie out of Harvest getting sick. You have Robert Morris. You have all of these evangelical pastors. You have these conservative Republican leaders all getting sick at this Rose Garden, what they're now dubbing uh, Rose Garden Massacre, as a superseder event. And then after that event, Trump comes out that, um, uh, man, he, he's sick with COVID and he has his symptoms. Um, and he's at Walter Reed and the drugs, the, the cocktail that he's given, uh, the experimental cocktail he's given, is from stem cell research. Um, and as we know, evangelicals and conservatives are against stem cell research because they see that as an abortion issue. And so the very thing that's saving Trump is the very thing that he worked to overturn. And it's a cyclical thing where in our religious system, we take this formula and move it for political power. And the irony of that, it can't be lost on us um, if, if we're paying attention. That our Christian faith, the purity of our heart is not about taking our destiny into our own hands or being in control. But if we take the Trump administration and this COVID experience of Trump as a case study, what we see is, man, Trump is saved by the very thing that he's trying to undo. And for us as Christians, I wonder how, how much are we um, undoing the very thing that will save us? It is not our strength that saves us. It's our weakness and our meekness. It is not our power that saves us. It's our humility and submission. Jesus did not come um, to build an empire. He came to bring people into the kingdom. And it comes through the cross. Um, it comes through death. And, and so, I, I mean, yeah, like for, for Phil in his doctor ministry program with uh, semiotics and, and reading the times, like for me, as I look at, at just this timeline of events, this isn't trying to like plot a conspiracy. I'm just saying it's ironic <laughs> at a baseline level that the superseder event where Trump is a super spreader, uh, he is saved by the very thing that he set out to undo. And it's at that event where he confirms his nomination for the justice that's going to undo abortion. But he's saved by stem cell research, which he should be very against as a conservative evangelical. I, the, it's ironic. <laughs> <laughs> One other thing, I'll, one other thing I'll jump in with before before you go, Matt. Um, it seems like the notion that when we wed our religious experience, when we wed our church life with what's going on politically, that we almost have a sense that we can legislate our righteousness. And so then, I mean, like, like they'll be in our pocket to be able to do the laws that we want. And I guess that's, I guess that's maybe what we're selling our, what we have been seeing you know, our leaders being sold into now where we want particular judges to be able to control and to legislate particular, the things that we've been mentioning, abortion and the like, um, Roe v. Wade and the like, right? Um, but yeah, just the, just the, what, what I want to say, just kind of uh, the, <laughs> it's not true. You know, um, our, we continue to have a way that stands counterculture. Jesus continually, I mean, who are you going to, you know, whose image is on the coin? Give on to Caesar what is Caesar's. The implication, right, whose image do you bear? Give up to God, who, you know, whose image you bear kind of thing, right? And it's just that, living into that thing where we think we can, yeah, we can control it all if we if we give in to this. is like, well, I, I, I don't see the connection there. And partly the reason I don't see the connection there is because I, I don't trust <laughs> that, that structure of authority. There's no reason for that structure of authority to be trusted. Maybe if you came from a particular perspective that you've consistently been able to, been on that side of that winner, but... My generation, my lineage have consistently been on the losing end of that. So there's no sense in me trying to trust that era. But I'm not going to legislate and, and work in that way. I'm going to continue to live counter and, and yeah, live in a way that, that bows down to the Father. Yeah, it's interesting. I am always 
baffled based on exactly what you said, uh, Phil, of how anyone, um, even if they're super religious, if they are of uh, a minority status, you know, where they're browner than I am, how they could even be okay with someone like Trump because he promotes this and yet he is just perpetuating what really has been the losing side for years for you, Phil, even for you, Tony, right? For the folks that have come before you and your family lineage and for uh, uh, your own people group. And yet like the religious right grab onto this. And that's where for someone like me, I, it just baffles me when, uh, uh, you know, whether it's, it's the uh, African Americans or Mexican Americans or Latinos or uh, Chinese or, or Japanese, like when they look at this uh, president and think he stands for me, you know, and even with the commandeering of, of, this position that he's taken on as the, the, the great deliverer, which I think is exceptionally um, dangerous because not one person that's in the United States today could actually go into a hospital and have all the treatment that he did, you know, at the levels that he did. And yet, like, if you listen to, if you ever read Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard talks about the greatest irony is this, this angst of the one thing that we perpetuate to be the greatest evil we turn to and use as self propelling. And that's exactly what you're saying is like those who are the most aggro against abortion, you know, theory, and this is where the Republicans should be like, well, wait a minute, if the cocktail that gave this guy life, we should be absolutely 100% against it. And at that Rose Garden, talk about like a, a conflation of you had the president of Notre Dame. You have Greg Laurie, one of the, the big evangelical leaders, okay? You had then uh, now a Supreme Court justice nominee. I mean, talk about uh, a, a, a meshing of worlds that then just gets so convoluted and uh, uh, confusing. Because then when the religion, Franklin Graham was there, right? Franklin Graham is the guy who stood up and said, you know, Trump is the last stand against this evil pressures of the, the left. And, They've been pushing this. And yes, Tony, you're right. We don't want to get into, oh my gosh, this conspiracy. But over the course of the last, uh, especially five days, there's been more and more talk of this satanic movement against Trump, trying to push him down, not willing to see him as the conqueror, the overcomer that he really is. He is our, he is our commander. He is our Superman. You know? And I'm sorry, but uh, the problem with the, the church today is, you know, like Bart said, Nietzsche understood Christianity better than the church itself because he understood the inconsistency of the worldly domination and that power and what the church actually purity of heart means is that the meekness, the weakness, the humility, all of the things that absolutely stand in antithesis towards the Trump campaign. And I'm not even trying to push another candidate, okay, because I still believe that the Democrats have their own issues that they have to deal with as well because, look, I want the choice to be that regardless of if it's a little nugget within uh, the belly of a woman or uh, a nine, nine month old ready to be born, that that life is sacred. We see it as such. And so I don't think any one of us is going to say, although this political party has it right, but we're speaking into the, uh, the, the truth that is confronting us. The way in which Trump is confronting and, 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 and meeting with the COVID-19 as well as with the racial tensions is exactly who he is. And this is the character of a nation that he is seeking to raise up. The question is, is that Christian? Because I just don't see it being inclusive of you, Phil, or of you, Tony. And when I start to, to move out and start to talk and, and give, hey, I want to partner with you guys, then it's not inclusive of me either, because now my white skin now is not the, the proper tone of what this movement is calling for from the evangelical and it really, I mean, I, it could be a slip of a tongue when we say it, but evangelical white sounds a lot like evangelical right. And so to be right is to be white. And so when we say, oh, let's have patience, civility, we need to be calm in this stuff. That to me is just gaslighting to uh, uh, the white saying, hey, look, this is how we're going to keep our Christian, you know, brown and, and black brothers and sisters down because we'll, we'll, hey, be respectful. You know, this is what Jesus calls. And yet really all it is is just code language to saying we don't really give a crap about anyone else uh, that doesn't look like us. You know? And so if you're not with Trump, you're what? You're against him in this evangelical movement. And I think that's the, 
then the purity of heart for the church gets so tainted and stained in humanness. It's not the denial of our humanness because Christ was fully human. What it is is a recognition that Christ came to do something. So that through the Spirit, that the love of God would pour down to our hearts so that transformation within would then pour out so we would live toward one another. You know, like uh, Philippians 2 said, do not do anything from selfish conceit, but to elevate the other beyond yourself. I just wonder, how are the actions of the president leading that way? And where are the church leaders with a pure heart for Jesus to stand up and say anything? And then how do we, I, I'm sure if you guys, you know, call up the president, he's not going to take your call. If you call up Greg Laurie, you know, or, or uh, Driscoll or Bill Hybels or Rick Warren, they're not going to say, oh, Phil, Phil, we been waiting for your call, Phil. What do you think it is? You know, hey, Tony, good stuff on New Wine Court. I want to really, they're not, they're going to be like, dudes, know your place, you know, and get thee behind me. So what is the way forward then? Uh, Matt, you, you may not push a candidate because you're more sanctified than I am, but I, I would totally push a candidate. I mean, I, I represent Bernie all the way because, and this is sacrilegious. I know it is, but my question would be, when was the last time we saw a Jew wander the countryside, try to give people free health care? Jesus tried to give people eternal health care. Bernie is trying to give people temporal health care. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. No, I mean, to, to quote the great Swiss, Swiss German uh, Karl Barth, he says, uh, Jesus does not seek to turn persons into Christians. He seeks to turn persons into comrades. For real socialism is real Christianity in our time. That sounds scary to some people, but I, I, I think Bart was on to something. There's something to be said about there, this is not my property. What, whatever I touch this thing, this material, I cannot say this is mine. Because as a Christ follower, as a Christian, this belongs to the Lord, so it's ours. Um, one of the early church fathers, I believe it's Cyril, I'm going to butcher it, but he, he says, man, like any, uh, the, the bread you have in your cupboard and, and the clothes you have in your closet, that, that belongs to the poor. And if you don't give it to the poor, anything you have in excess, you're robbing the poor and therefore you're robbing God. That, that sounds pretty heavy, but for us, sitting so far down the cultural stream, the purity of heart is, um, I'll tithe 10% every month, and I'm, I'm not going to steal from other people because this property is mine. It's my private property, but it's the privatization of the person that leads to an impurity of the heart, um, because I am not a private person. Um, but by definition of a Christian, I belong to the community. And this isn't about collectivism. This is about Trinitarian communal participation. Um, and so whatever our politics are, there has to be preferential treatment in our politics. We all give preference. The, the question is in the purity of our heart, where does our preference lie? Does it lie for the rich, the elite, those in power, which then trickles down to us? Or does it lie in the marginalized majority? We're not talking about the moral majority. We're talking about the marginalized majority. And if Jesus gives preference to the marginalized and to the poor, his kingdom is much larger than our moral majority. Um, Jesus, God gives preference to the poor as it's revealed in Jesus, the fullest revelation of who God is, as Jesus gives preference to the tax collector and to the prostitute. If our churches do not reflect Jesus's preference, that says a lot about us and less about the tax collector and the prostitute. And this isn't to like uh, come from a high horse like higher ground and say man like people who are tax collectors and and who work in the sex industry are are terrible scummy people we need to address the the systems and the structures and the environments that push people into their line of work and jesus 
turns us from persons into comrades because he calls us forth from all of our occupations into the Trinitarian community. That this is, this may be startling stuff and, and too radical for some people, but I already just nailed myself as an anathema with that Bernie joke. So I, I, I'm, I'm already done. <laughs> Yes, Tony, you did. And attaching yourself to Bernie, yes, definitely, definitely we knew where you were going. So all of that made sense, what you just said. So, so, so let me try to come at it from a different perspective. When the paradigm is us versus God, when that's the paradigm, and he chose to, chose to redeem us, that demonstrates that he prefers the poor. I mean, that's the whole, the whole story's right there, right? The whole story's right there. And, and well, Tony, how, how could I be a capitalist? If, if everything I grab and everything I own isn't mine, that just tears apart all that pulled myself up from my bootstraps and all that kind of stuff, right? Because, yeah, we're not overcomers in that way. That's yeah. not how we overcome. We overcome when we, when we go to the cross, we bear the same cross that our Savior bears. And we allow him to draw people to himself. And those become our brothers and sisters. And we walk together in that light. Yeah, not in overcomers in the sense of I can grab all that I attain and if I choose to, to bless you with a little bit, to sprinkle you with just a little bit, that's good. No, 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 no. No, we die with our Savior. And we rise and we walk together. Yes, and see, that's, we just don't need to say anymore. I mean, that's why he's the, the pastor, man. That's why he's leading us because, like Phil is saying, man, we don't need anymore, and yet we try to add on to Christ, right? We try to add on as if he's not enough. And so we want to continue the discussion. We're totally stoked that you've joined us. Again, you can find uh, New Wine Uncorked on YouTube. Just go on over to YouTube, New Wine, New Wine Skins, uh, and hit subscribe because what Phil's talking about is exactly what Tony's talking about. It seems radical and stuff. Exactly what Luke uh, plays out in Luke 5, where the old skins that we have, where these thoughts seem radical, need to be transformed into new wineskins so that we can continue to stretch ourselves. And we do that together as we're dialoguing. And we want to invite you in this constant conversation that we're having through New Wine, you know, through New Wine Uncorked. Get over to our YouTube page where you see the New Wine Tastings where Dr. Mesker uh, is meeting with people. And then Friday, uh, Thursdays, live at 1, 1 p.m. Pacific time on our Facebook page, New Wine, New Wineskins. We go live to have a, this dialogue uh, with new wine table talks because this stuff is important and is confronting us on a daily basis. And we, as the church, if we want to have a purity of heart, so that the one thing that we will is the unity together in willing the love of God, the good of our Godhead. And next week we want to continue this: is if the church is unified, what is the economics of the the kingdom of God as opposed to the economics of this kingdom world? You know, talk about finances, but also then talk about exactly what we've been trying to elucidate here is the playing out of this on the world stage and so we're stoked that you guys joined us we're stoked that you continue to participate with new wine new wine skins uh again facebook uh we're on twitter as well look for us new wine skins on twitter as well as on instagram and on anchor.fm for those of you that are podcast listeners on behalf of tony and phil Matt, uh, thank you so very much for joining us for new wine and corked until next week we'll see you on the flip side <laughs>